I began practicing in the mid-1980s. And all we had in the mid-1980s as far as chemotherapy for metastatic breast cancer was um, doxorubicin and cyclophosphamide. We did have CMF. And then we had vinblastin and mitomycin C. That's all we had. Wow. It was really, um, you could also use some infusional 5-FU, which was used um, then. It's very, very, very limited. And the vinblastin mitomycin C was of limited cl clinical utility, very, very limited, and very, very, very myelosuppressive. So we, we, um, it was very, very limited um, options. Now um, we have a, a, a much larger number of chemotherapy uh, options. Truthfully, um, only a, a few of them have really been demonstrated at the highest level to prolong survival, uh, but they, they certainly can get prolonged progression-free uh, survival. I remember so distinctly when the taxane, paclitaxel was the first, of course, um, right around 1990 uh, or so. It was just an amazingly non-cross-resistant agent after doxorubicin. And it really revolutionized um, metastatic disease um, and gave patients durable responses and improvement in survival. That was very, very um, impressive. Docetaxel came out very soon thereafter also. A, and it, these agents could put patients into deep clinical response, complete responses that would last sometimes for years. And they could, on the um, paclitaxel, they could just get it, keep getting it, you know, with docetaxel, you'd have to stop after about six, seven cycles because of anasarca. But, um, Amazingly so. Um, and then um, in 1998, capecitabine was approved by the FDA. And lo and behold, it was approved specifically because it's non-cross-resistant with the anthracyclines and the taxanes. And um, it, those patients were having about a 13-month about a survival after an anthracycline and a, a taxane. Now, continuous infusion 5-FU was also useful there, but it was very, very cumbersome for patients to have to get continuous infusion 5-FU. So capecitabine was another big, big step forward uh, there. And then the next uh, agents that came out were the apothalones, you know, and the one that has been FDA approved is ixabebolone. And ixabebolone, uh, as a single agent, had limited development. It did have a response rate of about 18% in patients who had had an anthocycline, a taxane, and capecitabine. So it does have a response rate. No improvement in overall survival, but still it was a non-cross-resistant agent to some extent. But when you put it together with capecitabine um, in patients who have more heavy tumor burden after an anthocycline and a taxane, particularly those patients who are refractory, primary refractory or have rapid recurrence after neoadjuvant or adjuvant anthocycline taxane. The combination of the ixabebolone and capecitabine was clearly better than capecitabine alone and led to approval of that combination. So that became useful for patients with, I call it severe disease, more refractory disease. It became useful. And then most recently was the aribulin that became available to us via phase three uh, trials. And that one was, was different because it was the only one we had seen that could really improve survival of late-line metastatic breast cancer patients. It was sufficiently non-cross-resistant with all the other microtubule agents, you know, the taxanes and the, the apothalones, that because it works differently against the microtubules. Um, and it, it basically, you could get very rapid responses. And, and pull the chestnuts out of the fire, basically, when patients had extensive liver disease or lung disease and prolonged survival uh, in those patients. So we've had a very good evolution over time, and there's more to come. I think the, um, the topoisomerase 1 uh, inhibitors, the, some of the antibody drug conjugates that are, that are utilizing um, SN38, you know, such as the trope, trope 1 sachituzumab, uh, is, is an example where I think that's going to be an exciting uh, agent. So there's been very good progress, but the key, I think, has been that what has been brought to the armamentarium has been non-cross-resistant with what we already had. More and more, as patients are doing better and better with advanced disease, um, we're seeing situations where patients are using many different treatment approaches during the lifetime of, of their cancer. And consequently, we're seeing more and more lines of therapy being utilized in the modern era compared to times past, plus we have more agents to choose from uh, with better activity. Um, so patients are living longer with advanced disease. Our goal is for it to become a chronic disease like other medical illnesses, diabetes, heart disease, what have you, and try to manage it for as long as possible with the least amount of side effects. 
So um, the landscape has really changed. And um, sadly, uh, we have patients that have really run out of opportunities for chemotherapeutics because we've actually run through them all. And in those patients, we're considering participation in clinical trials frequently. So it is a big problem. Uh, we need um, more and better therapies because patients are doing well for much longer periods of time. Uh, but that's another challenge for the field to come up with uh, newer and better treatments for those patients to, to, to do even better. It's really exciting to be in the clinic now because of all of the clinical research opportunities and so many new treatment approaches. Um, but many of them are still based on a backbone of chemotherapy. For instance, uh, let's take the excitement and the enthusiasm about uh, immuno-oncology and treatment with the checkpoint inhibitor antibodies which are very promising, already FDA approved for other disease states like non-small cell lung cancer and melanoma, uh, et cetera. These are now being tested in uh, metastatic breast cancer, in triple negative disease, uh, but with a chemotherapy backbone, usually a, a, a taxane. And uh, consequently, we still have to be mindful of all the principles of chemotherapy and worry about the toxicities. But it holds great promise that um, in combination with chemo, these uh, antibodies that uh, augment uh, uh, cytotoxic T cell immunity against cancers uh, might uh, be a huge benefit. So um, even in clinical research, we're often looking at a chemo backbone. Uh, the same is true for new uh, human-engineered HER2 antibodies. Those are in the salvage setting in phase three trials right now, and uh, those are using a chemo backbone head-to-head uh, -head against trastuzumab for a, a FDA registration attempt.